Welcome to MA Now. We are here with our first faculty interview, Professor Mark Campbell, the SC Thomas Z Director of the Sibley School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Jeff? I'm doing very well. We'll jump right into this. What inspired you to study robotics and control systems? Well, I think, uh, like a lot of things in academia, it's really the students who sort of pulled me into this. Did a lot of student satellite projects, formation flying satellites, looking for Earth-like planets. Um, and then about seven or eight years ago, I was on sabbatical, and one of my PhD students was working with a group, and uh, they asked me to help lead a proposal focused on uh, a DARPA program called the DARPA Urban Challenge, trying to develop an autonomous car. So I spent about a month working day and night with these students. Uh, they were in Ithaca, I was in Australia, and uh, we had uh, a great time. We were lucky enough to win the program. And then I worked with them for the next two years on developing the, the car we affectionately call Skynet. And uh, it's really kind of taken off since then. What are some like, real-world applications of, of the robotics that you're working with? The real-world applications of uh, the robotics I'm working in are um, certainly with autonomous driving, there's been a big push to put this technology into cars. Mm -hmm. So there's um, a lot of car assist technologies, for instance, adaptive cruise control systems. Um, stay in lane technology. So when someone like brake checks me on the highway, my car will Absolutely. adjust to it? Absolutely. There's some cars now that have not only adaptive assist and lane control, which will allow you to drive up right behind cars and just, just it'll slow, sync up. It'll slow down and stay right behind that car. Uh, if you drift off into the lane, it'll pull you back in. Um, and there's different kinds of technologies there, either to warn you mm -hmm. and say, okay, pay attention to the road, yeah. Joe, you know, you're sliding <laughs> off there, or actually pull you back into the road specifically, so it's, that's a, it's more of an active technology. Uh, what autonomous robots are represented in like pop culture, mu movies, music, you know, TV, and what do you think these machines will be integrated into everyday lives in like, reality? So for me, I guess the... The inspiration probably was uh, was Star Wars when I was growing up. So I think that was uh, that was the movie that I loved the most. I still remember my uh, father taking me to that movie. Uh, couldn't wait for each of the sequels and everything like that. I think it maybe because it was a combination of space and robotics, right? Um, which is sort of what my background is right now. But certainly the robotics examples in there: C three PO, R two D two, and uh, I think everybody likes R two D two. You know, not only because it's uh, cute and everything like that. But in my mind, it also was it showed intelligence. It's mm -hmm. a little bit closer to what uh, people are little, little, you know like and uh, um, like to be interactive with it, even in sounds. It didn't really speak, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but you can you can get all of that just from the sounds, which I thought was very creative. And I think uh, there's been in pop culture, there's been you know many examples. Mm -hmm. Right? There's the the, the Terminator, uh, Skynet, which is what our car is mm -hmm. is all about. Um, some nicer examples like Wall-E. Uh, Star Trek is a big one. So there's many cultural examples, and I think. I think that's a testament not only to robotics and space and those types of things, but just how much our culture really uh, engages these topics. And, and it's a way for people to think into the future, see into the future uh, about what things could maybe be like. How do you see these, this technology being integrated into like the household? Well, I think that's the wave of the future is personal robotics. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you look at where the research is right now, having the robots interact more closely with people and with humans, and there's a really nice push on this right now. There should be some type of interaction where there's trust, there's safety. Uh, if you're going to have a robot in the home interacting with kids, you want to uh, make sure that it's a safe environment. Yeah. But also a very natural environment, so there's a lot of research now in natural language interactions. And I think that's the goal of, of, of where a lot of the research is going right now. So how many years uh, in your estimation as a expert in the field until we have Rosie Jetson in the in the home. You could probably get one in five years. Rosie? Full Rosie? Yes. I don't know about full Rosie. You're asking a lot there, Joe. That's true, I guess. Um, so it depends on how much you want. I mean you have to you have to understand that like there there is a vacuum cleaner already, so there's already some technology in there. There's already robots now that can autonomously fold laundry. Mm -hmm. I think there's more complex things like making dinner. The the bigger the more open-ended the task, the more challenging it is. Right? Sure. So the, the, the robotics right now can do almost anything you repeat and do. Like if I want a robot to go down the hall and get my mail every single day, I can build that right now. The real challenge is, uh, you know, okay, a robot can fold laundry, but what happens if I have five different towels or you know a weird shirt yeah. or something like different that? Different shapes right? and sizes. Exactly. Yeah. So it has to be able to handle those kinds of uncertain situations, and so that's really where the technology is right now. Just focusing on these new. Um, environments, these new objects, uh, these new interaction mechanisms that are actually coming up.
Uh, what examples of experimental learning opportunities do, uh, does Cornell offer to its students? Cornell in general has many uh, opportunities. Uh, there's student project teams, um, uh, which is a big part of our culture now. But uh, students also get really involved in research. And so in my group, um, we have students who can start day one. I have two freshmen in my lab right now. We usually ease students in at the very beginning, uh, uh, assign them a mentor working with a PhD student. Um, usually do something small, uh, like conduct some sp experiments with some PhD students or develop a new piece of hardware for one of our robots or maybe a small piece of software. Once they've been in the lab for a, a, a short period of time and they un understand our infrastructure and how we're working and what our projects are, um, then things open up a little bit. Um, and they can start to define their own uh, path if they want to do that. And so some of our best students have have uh, done a really nice job of defining new projects, taking us in new directions that we weren't really thinking of, of, of going. One of our students is trying to um, uh, create a robot to, to do a campus tour. Uh, so our students publish some of their work and go to conferences and things like that. Um, so there's all kinds of opportunities, I think, for undergraduates and master's students, not just the PhD students, to get involved in, in, in research with, uh, with faculty members. Thanks. Thank you. You're Appreciate welcome. It. All right. I appreciate it, too.